looking at you like, sir, you going to be the mom? I don't she was just with five of the kids. She was some group therapy later on. Right in the middle of the The past years old. I got kicked when I was a baby. All right, guys. Uh, can I get a few people to pray for our son? Uh, Tori, Spurlock, and Billy. You guys want to pray for me? <laughs> Jesus, uh, as I sit here right now, um, I just want to give my heart to you, uh, to be molded and shaped by you. That any part of my heart that is hard or if there's any pride in me or any of us that is keeping us from seeing what is getting in the way of us and you, Jesus, uh, that we would allow you to smash it. That if our clay does not look how it's supposed to look, uh, that we would allow you to smash us. Uh, I pray, Jesus, just that our ears would be open, that our eyes would change. <coughs> whatever it is that you want to reveal to us, Jesus, and that we would eagerly throw it all off just to be close with you. That our one desire would just be to be with you. We pray this in your name. Uh, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for bringing us all together here. Uh, thank you for the food and the meals that's provided to us. <coughs> that we can take for granted that we very much appreciate and uh, acknowledge. I want to thank you for bringing us all here together, and not only as as roommates in a program, but as family. And uh, all, every the light that you've shown us, um, the the way, and everything. Um, thank you for everything. Amen. Yeah, Jesus, thank you for allowing us to sit under <coughs> the wholesome teaching of your word. And I pray that you would produce in us a desire uh, to be conformed to you in every way, Lord Jesus. And that's what I pray, Jesus, that all of us would be conformed to you in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God and they will be my children.
great chasm that separates us from Jesus, apart from Jesus. And in, in Luke, Jesus tells the parable of a rich man and Lazarus. Um, and in this parable, Abraham says to the rich man who is separated, he says, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Uh, Jesus says in John, says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And, uh, and Peter, all <coughs> praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and now we live with a great expectation, or with a living hope. <coughs> and we have this priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay.
to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship them. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. As we take communion, I just hope that we realize that Jesus Christ's body and blood that he shed for us that we partake in here in church that we're putting on his right living and apart from him you know that we can't but he can Oh, no. 
successes, my scheme and my pursuits. If I lose, let me lose my life. But if I belong to Jesus, the flesh is crucified. James 4, 13, I'm going to start 13 and go 17. It says, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town, and we will stay there a year. We will do business and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It is here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do, and then not do it. Still having <clears throat> voice issues, so. Um, is that good? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, for sure. All right. 
Um, as I've been like praying about this passage, you know, it's one of those weird things because <clears throat> everything in this book is so important. Right? Everything in this book is so valuable. Everything in this book is so important. I mean, this is Jesus speaking. Um, but I know, like, for my life personally, and a lot of what I've seen since I've been following Jesus, I don't know that there could be a more important passage of Scripture than what Wash just read. So, <clears throat> I'm going to date myself a little bit here. So, when I was a construction foreman, we had all these dump trucks. I had 30, 40 of us with five-man crews. And we went all over the state of Ohio. And, you know, in the center console, there was a stack of map books. And so if you want to get somewhere, you had to know how to read a map book. And, you know, the foremans would get together in the morning. And sometimes you didn't have the right map book. You know, you'd have to look through all your map books. And you'd have to go ask other foremen, you got the map book to go to this city or that city because you didn't have it. And so we would have a meeting in the morning and the foremen would all get together and we would talk about the route that we were going to take, you know, and, and we would compare like where we were headed that day, where our crews were headed, what city, and we would talk to one another and we would study these little map books and we would plot out like the route that was best to take and maybe one of the guys on another crew or, or a foreman on another crew had been in that city previously and he'd be like, oh man, you know, stay away from this route because there's a bunch of construction going on. Uh, you know, if you go this way or, you know, you try and figure it out because you don't want to pay tolls or whatever, you know, and you wanted the quickest way there. And so we would sit there and plan out these routes and talk to one another. And then came MapQuest, right? And I remember I was still a foreman and I was like, Oh man, MapQuest is so cool. You can like get on the computer and it's the same thing, right? There's like all these different routes, but like MapQuest did the work for you and would give you a few different options and you'd be able to pick one and then it would like print this like nine pages out, you know, and you're like trying to like look and make sure you don't miss the turn. Um, and then there was the GPS and they started to buy GPSs and stuff for the trucks. But it was the same thing, like, you know, and now we have maps on our phone, and it's just like, this is a normal thing, right? You got to get anywhere. You can even choose to walk, like, you don't know where you're at. I've done this. I've been, like, lost outside of a business. I'm like, it's supposed to be right here, you know? You just put it in. It's like, you're, like, 30-second walk, idiot. And so, you know, you go around the corner. But, like, when you type in these addresses, right, you have one destination that you're headed to. And yet there's all these different routes that you can pick and choose to get there. And a lot of times you're, you're, you're picking and choosing the route based on what? Maybe what's the fastest. Maybe what's the easiest. Maybe what's not going to cost you as much to get there. You know, you, you try and find the smoothest route to get to where you're going. Now, it's easy if we were talking about the world to go, okay, yeah, the world claims there's a bunch of different gods, right? And there's a bunch of different ways to get to God and to heaven. But that's not what's happening in this passage. He's talking to people that would all agree Jesus is the only way. But nobody's arguing about that here in this passage. All these people that he's talking to are going, yeah, no, no, no. Jesus is the only way. Like, he's the only way to the destination. And the destination is him. And it's in eternity with him. And it's in heaven with him. And eventually a new heaven and a new earth with him. And so everybody in this passage would agree on that. But what he's dealing with is a lot of other people. And this is what I've dealt with a lot since I've known Jesus. That we think we can kind of choose our own route while we follow Jesus. And, and it's crazy because it's no different than the way that people choose their own route to go places. You, know, you don't want to take the tolls because you don't want it to cost you any money. People try and choose the route to follow Jesus that's not going to cost them very much. People try and choose the route to follow Jesus, you know, that's going to be smooth. I don't want to drive in construction. I want to avoid the traffic. I, you know, I don't want it to be this thing that's kind of hectic that I have to go through. And people think 
These people think it. There's people sitting in this room that still think it. There's people that I've met over the last seven years of following Jesus. In fact, I have to tell you, I've met more people over the last seven years that claim to follow Jesus that think you can pick your own route on how you're going to follow him. They go, okay, man, no, my, my eternity is secure. You know, my destination is secure, but I can kind of pick my own route. And, and there's always kind of this, this debate or this tension with people that say they're following Jesus because they're like, hey, it's okay to follow Jesus this way or that way. You know, we're, we're all following Jesus. But the problem is, is that people think their eternity is secure and they've made their own route to follow him. And it's just not how it works. That if you're really going to follow Jesus, right, that he gets to lay out the route for your life. Now, these routes are probably going to look a little different in people's lives, sure. But it's not going to be because you have the option to choose one. You don't get to choose your own route. That's not how it works. Like, Jesus chooses the route. Jesus lays out the route for us to follow. And that's why it's so funny when people think you can choose your own route to follow Jesus, and they just think you're wrong. You know what? Their route always is smooth. The one that they're trying to pick is always supposed to be the smooth, easy route. And yet Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 says, no, 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 no. That's the way to destruction. Like Jesus says this. The easy, wide road. The nice, smooth, paved road with, with no tolls that doesn't cost you anything. And you know, with no construction. That easy, wide road, that's the path to destruction. And then he says, he goes, no, 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 but the path of following me, it's difficult. It's packed with traffic and, and construction. And it's going to cost you. And not a little bit. Like a toll, but your life. And that's what, and it's crazy because a lot of times people that say that this is the route that Jesus has them on to follow, it doesn't involve discipleship. It doesn't involve laying down your life for discipleship. Like I was thinking today about 2 Timothy chapter 2 where it's talking about discipleship. Or teach these things to other trustworthy people that will teach them to other people. It's clearly discipleship. And then he gives the three examples of, of a suffering soldier and, and an Olympic athlete and an exhausted farmer. And so I was just thinking of this in the context of like, hey, if you signed up for the military, you think maybe some things would change in your life? Right? You, you wouldn't sign up for the military and go, well, this is how I want to join the military. You know, I'm not going to do boot camp. You know, you call me and you let me know if there's a war and maybe if I think it's not too dangerous or maybe if I believe in the cause, then I'll go. And that's not how it works. Right? If all of a sudden, let's just say one of us are in this room extremely talented in sports. Maybe they're going to have an Olympic cornhole team. I don't know. <laughs> we got some. We got some runners, right? We got some people. Got some people who might sign up for that. But it's like all of a sudden you joined the Olympic cornhole team, right? They came and they recruited. You're like we need you for USA, <laughs> right? Grab your bags and come on. No one at your clothes bags. The little bags. Come on, <laughs> right? <laughs> But they say, man, we need you for the U.S. Olympic cornhole team. <coughs> like, it wouldn't be like however you want it to be. Your whole life would change. Right? There'd be training and there'd be constant work that would need to be done. And, and you wouldn't get to pick and choose when you're going to show up and when you're not going to show up. And how it looks and how you want to play on the Olympic team. Now, I would use if you... Inherited a farm, but I say that in Worcester, like a bunch of you're going to be like, we did. <laughs> I know, it's just like, it's, it doesn't work. But even then, right, it's a lot of work. You inherited a farm, and it's just like, your life changed. There was animals that needed, they needed fed before the sun came up, and things needed done. 
And it's just like, it wasn't just like, well, you know, I'm just not going to get out of bed and do stuff today. I'll farm tomorrow. That's just not how it works. And so it's just crazy to me that even when people think they can pick their own route, it doesn't involve giving up your life for Jesus and the gospel. It doesn't involve giving up your life for discipleship, for being discipled and making disciples. You know, in, in Psalm, listen, in Psalm 37, verse 23, this is what it says. The Lord directs the steps of the godly, and he delights in every detail of their life. So you see here, Jesus goes, no, 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 I pick the route. I pick the route for you to follow as you follow me. It's just not like, hey, there's this destination here, and now you get to kind of pick your own route, pick and choose how you follow me, and then you're just going to end up there. That's why so many people are going to end up there and go, what? What do you mean you don't know us? He said, look, you picked your own route. You are with me. But he says he directs the steps, so he gets to, to pick the route. And it says he delights in your life when he's guiding your steps. And I know we would like to think that he just always delights in our lives. And he's delighting in our lives when we're picking our own route to follow him. But that's not what he says. He goes, no, like I'll pick the route. I'll direct your steps and I'll delight in every detail of your life. And then here it goes on in 24. And this is how you know whether you've picked your own route or not. It says, though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. So you see this picture of Jesus going, hey, listen, if you go the route that I picked for you, he goes, you might stumble a bit. He goes, you'll never fall. Isn't that completely opposite of what the world tells you? Mm -hmm. I mean, the world's like, hey, it's just a part of it. It's just a part of the disease. It's just a part of the program. It's just, hey, relapses. It's just something to do. It's like, you just fall down. That's just part of it. That's so opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus goes, listen. The reason you fell on your face is because you weren't letting me direct your steps. I wasn't there to hold your hand because you weren't on the route that I picked for you. It's not like, hey, it doesn't matter how many times you fall. It's like, man, I don't ever fall. Even though I start to stumble, it's like Jesus just, he just grabs me. He just holds me secure. And that's how you know. That's one of the ways I think that you just, that you just know <laughs> If you're making your own route, if you're choosing your own route, well, you keep falling. That's clearly not the route Jesus has for you. Because he says you won't fall. You know, and, and even in like Job 23, uh, in, in chapter 14, you know, Job just says, he just makes a statement. He just goes, man, he goes, uh, the Lord, master, right? Because that's what that means. He goes, he'll do, he will do to me whatever he has planned. Now, some of us might be able to get behind that and go, yeah, Jesus is going to do whatever he wants to me. But, like, is your attitude really like, no, here I am, Jesus. Do whatever you want to me. Whatever you have planned. He goes, he'll do whatever he wants to me, whatever he has planned. Because he goes, you know what? He controls my destiny. He controls my destination. So the one who's given me this new, eternal, joyful destination is the one who knows how to get me there. And it's not like the world. And it's not like map books or map quest or GPS where you get to pick and choose the route that you get to take. Because the Lord, Master, directs my steps. And so that's when he delights in every detail of your life. And so his plans are, are the only ones that matter. That's it. His plan and his plans for your life. Now, think about it. The world tells you you've got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. I don't know how many times I've sat across from people in positions of authority in this world. And they're like, well, where are you going to be in a year? Where are you going to be in five years? Where are you going to be in ten years? You've got to have a plan. You've got to have goals. You'll never be successful if you don't have these things laid out, if you're not focused on these things. Well, the problem with that is Jesus and the world define success completely different. Opposite. 
They're different. Completely opposite. And so the world tells you, you got to have these plans and you got to, or you'll never be successful. It, it, it goes right to, like, how do you define success? And are you defining success? Or are you letting Jesus define success and, and what it looks like to actually have a successful life? Now, what's so powerful about this passage is, think about this. If you just thought of what an evil plan is, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? When you think of an evil plan, well, we've been a part of some, right? We've sat around and made some evil plans. And so we're, everybody in this room is pretty good at putting together some evil plans. Stealing and taking stuff that's not yours, right? And you think about evil plans, you think about the most evil plans, and you can think about people that have lived in this world and, and, and tried to take over countries and all kinds of stuff, and murder and all kinds of stuff, right? When you think of an evil plan. And, and, and he was even talking about that a little bit ago in James 4, right? At the beginning of that chapter, he's like, hey, you're jealous of people and you don't have what you want. So you kill and you steal to try and take it from people. And so you would think when he's talking about an evil plan, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But look at what he says here. He says an evil plan is somebody who goes, I'm going to go to this city and I'm going to have a business and I'm going to make a profit. It's not really your definition of an evil plan, right? It's not what comes to mind. You could, in fact, say that probably to anybody in the world, and they'd be like, man, hashtag goals. <laughs> right? They'd be like, that's so good. You're going to be successful. Just keep your eye on that. That city you want to go to, that business you want to have, and that profit you want to make. And then here's the most terrifying thing. You could say that in almost any church Especially, hey, if you're the church for addicts, they come along and that's what they try and tell me. Like, well, how are they, when are they going to work and, and when are they going to you know, start a business and when are they going to have money and make a profit? And it's terrifying because Jesus here in James 4 goes, that's evil. And it's not what you would think of when you think of an evil plan. Because you could say that to almost anybody in the world, anybody in the church, and they'd be like, that's really good. That's good. Hold tight to your dreams. And yet Jesus says it's evil. He goes, that's evil. And you know why? Because you know the definition of an evil plan? Your plans. It's that simple. Don't overthink it. A definition, Jesus' definition of an evil plan is your plans. Anything about your plans. It's about his plan. It's about his plan. His plan for his world and the reconciliation of his world and the complete redemption of his world. And he's invited you to be a part of it. His plan for the complete redemption of you and others. And making all things new. And that's what Jesus is saying here in James 4. He's going, your plans are evil. It's the definition. And he's dealing with arrogance and self-confidence. Specifically, when he says this, otherwise you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. He's going, hey, otherwise you're being arrogant and, and you're having self-confidence Tell me who in the world's going to tell you that self-confidence is a sin and it's evil. No, but like, why would they tell you that? That's what you're lacking. You just don't have enough of it. You don't have enough of this evil. See, you listen to what Jesus is saying. He's going, you know, you know the world's going, you don't have enough of this evil in your life. If you just had more of this evil, you'd be successful. That's what the Word of God says. Because if you're self-confident, it's evil. That's what pretentious means. Arrogance and self-confidence. It's opposite what you think. 
It's opposite what I would think. And so obviously our plans are opposite of what his plans would be. Where we would try to avoid construction, you'd be like, no, that's where we're going to go. And so, I think another way that you can, you can tell if you're making your own plans is, because what, what happens is we start to get like these mental GPSs, and we start to put into place these destinations here on this earth as we're heading, so we think, to heaven. Right? And, and how you know you're making your own plans, another way that you would know that, is because you're not focused on eternity. See, your plans that are evil are going to have you focused on this life. They're going to have you focused on this world. They're not going to, they're not going to have you focused on eternity. And then Jesus says, that's what we should be focused on. That's where we should be anchored. It's hard to hear that last song, to live as Christ. It's hard to hear that before I come up and preach a message because I just want to go to Philippians and just preach that. I just go, man, is that where you're at? You really, man, to live, man, is just to be with Jesus here, to be working for Jesus here, but to die is even better. That's like, so what can people actually do to me, right? You don't have any of this. You're not tied to this world. And yet that's how you know you're making your own plans because you're not focused on eternity. It's got your eyes set down here. It's got your heart set down here. It's on the things of this life. It's on the things of this world. And another, I mean, because like, listen, I got, a, I got a calendar on my phone that I put stuff in, right? But that's not my master. It's not just like, oh, it's in my calendar, so I have to do it. And I come to Jesus. Oh, man, Jesus. You know, where, where do you want me? What do you have in store today? I mean, how many of us actually enter the presence of Jesus like that every day? And we're just like, yeah, I know that I think maybe some things uh, are going to take place today. Or I know that I've scheduled some things for tomorrow or the next day. But really, you know, even though those things are there, man, I'm not, I'm not counting on those things. Because another thing that it talks about here about being evil, about being arrogant, it's thinking you know what your life will be like tomorrow. You know how arrogant that is? To think you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow? When that breath that you just took is a gift? And like, it's, there's, there's an arrogance to us when we start to make our own plans and think we know what our life is going to even be like tomorrow. And here's the thing. I, I think that something that's so evil and so arrogant, that even people that would say they've been following Jesus forever, is when's the last time that they actually have asked Jesus, I don't know where you want me. See, it's so easy to just, you know, to start out following Jesus and, and then, like, you know, you just stop asking. You, you stop having that kind of dependence and that kind of relationship with Jesus where moment by moment, man, you're asking him what he wants to do and where he's going and just following, actually following him. And so Jesus says that your life is like a morning fog. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? That's a great question. There's a bunch of us that came in this room and we sat down tonight and we think we know what our life's going to be like tomorrow. And Jesus goes, how, how do you know? And what he's doing is he's just checking us, right? He's just putting us in check here. He's just going, see, the fact that you even came in and sat down and think you know what you're doing tomorrow and think you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow, there's an arrogance to that. There's something so evil to that. 
And he goes, you know, it's really easy to think you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. And see, once again, you're focused on what's going on down here, right? And you're not going to make the most of your, your time right now. And that's what starts to happen is because you think you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. So you don't take moment by moment as serious as you're supposed to. And that's what he's talking about here when he goes, your life's like a morning fog. You know, people have probably heard, man, you're, you're here today and gone tomorrow. He literally says it's like a mist. And so it's actually shorter than that, right? Because most of the time, the fog is gone by lunch. It's there in the morning, but it's gone by lunch. And so what Jesus points us to here is the brevity of life and how life is actually that short. And if you don't realize this, he says, you don't have any real wisdom. And this is what he says in, in Psalm 91, 12. He goes, man, Jesus, teach us the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. See, there's a wisdom to knowing and understanding. Like, <coughs> I don't know what my life's going to be like tomorrow. I don't even know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. He goes, that's where real wisdom will, will happen. When you realize you don't know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. When you're not fixated on your plans and what you think that you should be doing. When you're not trying to choose your own route, but you're in the moment with Jesus. You're walking that close with him. I mean, in Ecclesiastes 7, it says, hey, hey, you know, it's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. Look, who really believes that? Who really believes that sitting here right now? You see how opposite it is from what, how you think? He goes, it's, it's better. He goes, no, no, no. You know what? A wise person thinks about death all the time. And he goes, you know, an idiot thinks about only having a good time. See, that's just, not, that's just not how we are. But he says, you know, that there's this refining influence it has when you realize how short life really is. When you realize that he's in control of it. That it's like literally this gift moment by moment. I know we, we say things and you can find all the cliche posters and all the cool like sayings and stuff. Like, life's a gift and all that stuff. But that's just like, no, this is the word of God. <laughs> Where he's going, you don't know what you're like. <coughs> he's like, I have plans. And it's arrogant for you to sit here and think you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. And, and that you really don't even have wisdom if you don't think about death a lot. Because he says, you know what? That's one thing. You know, you're always wondering and you're always so unsure about things. Let me just tell you what you can be sure about. You're going to die. That's going to happen. In a world where we're so unsure and we're trying to figure out all these things and, and we're so not sure about things, I can tell you one thing that's for sure. <coughs> and that's what Jesus is saying. He goes, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. So you should think about it often because it will have a refining influence and it will affect you in the here and in the now. And so I love it because he goes, you know what you ought to do? That's what it says in verse 15. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and then do this or that. You see, it's not about the this or that. He goes, man, if the Lord wants us to, I realize if he even wants me to live, then I live. He goes, that's the kind of attitude you should have. That's where your, your thoughts should be fixed, right? Is that you're like, man, if Jesus even wants to give me life, then I'll live, and then, you know, there'll be this or that, and this or that being whatever he wants. The, the this or that is whatever Jesus wants to do. Like, man, you've given me life, and so whatever you want to do with it, it's yours. And we can get caught up so much on the this or that. So listen, this is, uh, I want to give you, I just want to lay it out here. Ephesians chapter 5. I just want to lay it out here. Jesus' definition, right, of a, of, a, of a successful life. Jesus' uh, plan made clear 
for, for everybody here. So listen to what it says here in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. And we were just talking about that. Be careful how you live. Don't live like a fool, but live like those who are wise. People who live that, that are like those that are wise are people who realize, I don't know what my life's going to be like one. Right, so he's going, don't live like a fool. Live like people who are wise and make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. He's going, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Make the most of every opportunity in the here and now, in the moment by moment. Like, don't get caught up in your own plans. Don't, don't be evil and try to make your own plans, but realize, like, man, there's opportunities that Jesus has called you to. Moment by moment. Now listen, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So he's laying out here what it looks like to have a successful life. He's going, you're not going to live like a fool. You know, you're going to make the most of every opportunity. You're not going to act thoughtlessly because you're going to understand what Jesus wants you to do. Think about it. How much of your day you spend acting thoughtlessly? You're just kind of going through the motions. You know, making the most of every opportunity. You just, you're just kind of like a zombie, right? You're just going through the day. This is just what we do. And, this is, and you're missing all these opportunities along the way. And it's directly tied to you thinking you know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. To you not realizing how short it really is. <clears throat> And that anything could change in a moment. But, but I love this because it's like, well, what does Jesus want me to do? He says, understand what he wants you to do. And I love this because right there you'd start to think, okay, what's your plan? What, what's the this or the that? But we're not even there yet because we're still with if he wants us to live. And real life is having rivers of living water. <laughs> in our heart. Real life is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what he says. He goes, you know what I want you to do? I want you to understand what I want you to do. I don't want you to be drunk on wine. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's going, I want you to be completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit. See, before we even get to this or that, this or that doesn't matter if there's not life and people are encountering Jesus in the this or that. He's going, you know what I want you to do? I want you to be completely under the influence of me and my spirit, like if you were drunk. If you're drunk and you say, you know, you, you say stupid things, you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you say stupid things, you do stupid things, you see things that that's not what's really going on. <laughs> you hear things differently. Right? You don't see clearly. <clears throat> you don't walk a straight line. That's why when you get pulled over, like, walk a straight line. Right? Because you're under the influence. And what he's saying, he goes, you know what I want you to do? I want you to understand what I want you to do. I want you to be filled with my spirit in such a way that you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And now you're seeing things like I see things. And now you're hearing things like I hear things. And he's going, and now you're walking like me, and you're, you're walking different, and you're talking different, and you're saying things that you, you wouldn't say. He's like, but it's me speaking through you. You're completely under my influence. You're drunk on me, and you're under my influence. Goes, that's what I want you to do. He goes, that's my plan. That's, that's his plan for your life. And he's going moment by moment. That you wouldn't miss any opportunity in these evil days for people to encounter me. And for you to be filled with my spirit. He goes, that's my plan. That's what he wants. You want to understand, see, it's more about who he wants you to be than something he wants you to do. Because it doesn't matter what you do. If you're not under the influence of the Holy Spirit completely, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not going to produce anything that really matters. And so it's so much more about who he wants you to be. And so he is, you know, 
If the Lord wants me to, I'll live and I'll be filled with life in a very dead place. I'll be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then, and then listen, it says in verse 17, remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. I was having a conversation before I came with a couple pastors that I love doing. And, and we were talking about, <laughs> and it wasn't even having to do with this, but we were talking about people and they were, they were challenging me. Hey, Ken, you know, do you, do you think that people aren't following Jesus if they do this and if they work or if they, they were trying to get in there and get at it and see if there was something there, like beneath the surface of my heart, where I had this very crazy view of like, you can't work, you don't follow Jesus. I said, man, I just started to talk to them about like, no, 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 that's not what this is about at all. And this was the example I gave them. Listen, if I came out tomorrow and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to go to Mansfield or, or I'm done after Mansfield. I'm, I'm not going to go to Cleveland. I'm not going to do it. Hey, you know what, Geneva, we're meeting in Geneva next month. I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm supposed to have a talk with Elkins. I'm not going to do I'm going to come back to Worcester. I'm going to move back into my room. I'm going to be the campus pastor here, man. I'm going to, I'm going to disciple the leaders here and I'm just going to preach and teach here. And I'm just going to stay here. Everybody would go, okay. Except him. I don't get to choose that. I don't get to do that. But everybody would think that's okay. I'm going, I don't get to, like, I don't feel like I have a choice. And it just blows my mind how many people that say they follow Jesus think they have a choice. And Jesus even says this in Luke 6, 46. He goes, why do you keep calling me Lord when you don't do what I say? You know how stupid that sounds? You're like, hey, master. And you know what we do? We come to him, Lord, master. We go, hey, Lord, master, can you do this for me? Hey, Lord, Master, would you go do that? It's like, doesn't that sound ass backwards? Like, I'm coming to the Master and telling him and ask him to do something for me? You realize what Lord and Master means, right? I come to you go, as a servant. I'm like, what would you have me to do, Lord? How did that get, how did that get mangled? Where did, we, where did we screw up along the way in the church? That we just come to the Lord and ask him to do things for us. We might not call ourselves Lord, but man, we sure play the role. It's like, he goes, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I said, I don't, yeah. Like you come to me, and then you hear me talk to you. He goes, but you don't follow. And he goes, that's why you keep collapsing. It's just like, I just don't have a choice, and I don't understand why so many other Christians think they do. And people say so casually all the time, I'll say yes to Jesus no matter what, and go, I don't believe you. Because I've just seen more people than not say that and walk away from him and think they have a choice. And, you, and, and that's just not what it is. When you say, Lord, it's like, no, oh, no, Lord, Lord, if I... I don't have a choice. You're my master. You're my master. Like whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. And I love it because he goes, well, you know, first things first. You need to be completely under my influence. You need to be completely filled with me and just drunk on me and completely under my influence. We start there and then we'll worry about this or that. Let's see, we're so caught up in this or that. And it wouldn't even matter because we're not completely under the influence of Jesus. You know, like I was talking about all these new doors that Jesus is opening and how fast everything's moving. And I was talking to Lego about this and Lego was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, man, we need to keep praying for workers for the field. We do all the time. And Jesus said to do that. Jesus himself, God the flesh, like, you know, we need is some workers. All right, let's pray about that. And so we're doing that all the time. And, and Lego is just like, you know, yeah, we need to keep praying for work. He goes, man, Jesus is really going to have to do something. And he goes, we need Jesus to move in some people's hearts. And I just felt conviction from the Holy Spirit right there. And I'm like, is that what we need? Is that really what we're lacking here? Jesus moving in people's hearts? Because I've seen workers for the field come and leave because they put in their application somewhere else to go follow Jesus how they choose. That's all I keep seeing. 
I just see, I just see Jesus constantly bringing workers for the field and then going, you know what? I like this job. I want to go do this job and follow Jesus because, you know, this one has a really good 401k. It's like you realize you have eternity for a retirement, right? Well, this one has really good health benefits. That's just, that's the mentality that I keep seeing. Go, it's not a lack of Jesus moving in people's heart. It's a lack of workers answering the call. That's what it is. That's what's happening. Now listen to me and hear me clearly. It's a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. See, it'd be a sin if I said, I'm just going to stay in Worcester and preach the gospel. It, like, it doesn't even line up with your head, right? You're just like, and preach the gospel and develop leaders and disciple leaders and, you know, everybody like, oh yeah. It's a sin because I know what I ought to do. And if I don't do it, it's, it's, it's evil. And so it's like, I just, I just constantly see Jesus bring workers for the field. But then go, you know what? I really like that field. I, I really like that, that field. <laughs> you know, that field comes with like a lot of, like it, it's sunny over there, you know, and it's like the soil's really soft. It's, it's not real hard on my back when I dig. And, you know, it's just like, you don't get to choose. It's a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. And so we're supposed to come to Jesus and just go, man, Lord, Lord, whatever. I, I love this. Jesus says, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So it's like, that's simple. It's like, oh, if I follow Jesus, I'll be honored. How? With his presence. But listen to what he says right before this. The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. This is John 12. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new life. Now it's clearly talking about the cross. Clearly, Jesus is going, listen, I'm going to die, and because I die, you know, it's going to produce life in so many people. But listen, it doesn't stop there. Those who love their lives in this world will lose it, and those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. See, people keep picking a field that, that they like because they get to hold on to their life. But they're going to lose it for eternity. And then he goes on to say, those who want to serve me must follow me. So he goes, see? He goes, you've got to die. <coughs> you're not going to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit until you completely give yourself to him and you die. Until you're just dead. And he goes, and then life will happen. But he goes, if you, it's only those who care nothing for their life in this world. I, mean, I didn't say it. Jesus did. And that's why I have to keep reminding people, like, I think I'm making this stuff up. Like, this is what I think. That's what I think. This is what Jesus says. Those, those who care nothing for their life in this world will save it for an eternity. But if not, they'll lose it. And it's a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. Period. Doesn't matter how good it sounds. Doesn't matter that it's going to be profitable, and it doesn't matter what you're going to do with them. None of that matters if it's not what he wants. His plan is the only one that matters. And so, like, as we pray right now, like, you know, communion, you know, when Zane was reading Romans 12. I'm sitting across from people in the jail all the time, and, and I love it when they go, man, I'm back in jail. I tried to follow Jesus. It just didn't work. You know where I go? Romans 12. And you know why? Because I go, did you completely give yourself to Jesus as a living sacrifice? You realize the picture. It's an animal being tied to an altar and completely killed and sacrificed and burned up. I go, did you do that with your life for Jesus? Is that what it looked like as you said you tried Jesus? Is that what it looked like as you followed Jesus? You did that and ended up back in jail? I'm like, are you here for preaching the gospel? Is that what happened? 
a group of Pharisees ran up on you and, and arrested you and threw you in here. Is that what happened? And that's never been yes yet. <laughs> right? And don't think it's because the Pharisees are gone. <laughs> Plenty of them around. Right? So, so listen, but it's like, you did that and you came back to jail? And you know what? They, I've never once heard anybody go, yeah. They all go, no, nah, I didn't do that. You see, they made their own route. They picked their own route. And so they fell again. They fell. Because they weren't with Jesus, so he couldn't grab them by the hand and keep them from falling. They weren't. They made their own plans. So I, I, as we pray, I, I hope that we just really come to a place it's like we understand that scripture. Like, no, 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 I'm all, I'm a, here I am, a living sacrifice for you, Jesus. Lord, what would you have your servant to do? <laughs> Lord, you know, Joshua 5, I love it, he falls on his face at Jesus' feet when he shows up right before he goes into Jericho. You know, runs over there, whose side are you on? He's like, I'm the Lord of Heaven's armies. He's right down on his face. He's like, at your command. Lord, what would you have your servant to do? Right? He's in a place of complete surrender. He says yes before he knows what he's got to do. And I'm praying that for us. As we pray right now, we would come to Jesus like a living sacrifice. Lord, what would you have your servant to do? Because it's a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. Let's pray. Yes.